And do you think that God doesn't care that all of His creation, that when we curse them, when we have ugly words to say to people, when we don't bless them instead, I'm only called to do one thing, and that is to bless. Regardless of how you treat me, regardless of what circumstances I'm in, I have one calling, and that is I am to bless everything. Father, that you just cause this rain to let up in the natural, not the spiritual, though. And we just ask you to help this uh, critical situation for some people to change. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. You may be seated. If you're visiting or if you're not, this is the first time and you have heard what has happened, I, I need to recap real quickly. And that is... Uh, uh, at the first of the year when we were um, coming back from Oklahoma and came back on New Year's Eve, uh, it was the rivers, everything was swollen even back then, so we had a lot of rain in December. And the Lord spoke to my heart laying in bed listening to it rain. And here's what I felt like he said to me. I'm about to pour out my blessings and favor. I'm about to send a flood, that's what it is. I'm about to send a flood of my blessings and favor. And I said, Lord, I'm from Missouri, prove it. I went upstairs, I reached for a book that I just bought, didn't even know what was in the book, opened it up to the second chapter. And then I looked down and the, a writer said, I am a meteorologist to whoever's reading this, and I want to tell you there's a flash flood warning because I'm about to pour out a flood of my blessings and favor. It's exactly what the Lord said to me. And I, I wrote it down. I said, Lord, okay. You're about to pour out on people that are willing to receive this flood. And you name two things. Blessings and favor. I've never preached an entire series on that. Uh, but I feel like the Lord is saying... 1 Corinthians says, 15, first comes the natural, then the spiritual. And I told somebody, somebody came up to me and says, you're at fault. You're the reason why we're having all this rain. Because I said, God said, I'm about to flood. But if I tell you what, if the flood of spiritual blessings that are about to hit this church and other churches is going to take place like the natural is taking place, we're about to get some rain in the spirit. I received it. I don't know about you. I received it. <laughs> Paul, Paul Hawkins, this man's daddy, lived to be how old? 94. 94. I have never seen anybody receive from God as easily as him. It, it just seemed like when you prayed for him, he expected it, and it didn't matter what he had wrong with him. He, got, he almost got a healing about every time. And I, I found out it was his attitude that uh, I believe when you pray for me, I'm getting it. Yeah. It, it was just that it's mine. Yeah. And I loved his attitude. And I love to pray for him. I want that attitude. I mean, if the Lord's got blessings and favor that he yeah. wants to give out, and a lot of people don't care if they get it or not, well, I'm on the given. Uh, my dad used to say, the Bible says it's more blessed to give than receive. He said, receive is good enough for me. But the reason we receive is to give, I understand. But I'm just telling you, blessings. I'm about to pour out a flood. A flood of blessings and favor. What does it mean to be blessed? When God told Abraham, and this is just a, a recap. Told Abraham, I'm going to bless you. That's in chapter 12 of Genesis. In chapter 13 it says, and Abraham, Abram was rich in silver and gold and cattle. The next chapter, he's a rich man. Does that mean we're all going to become rich folks because of the outpouring of the favor? There's more riches than just points in your pocketbook. My Bible says God who is rich in mercy. There's some spiritual riches that we all need, right? Amen. So I'm telling you, I'm excited about God pouring out his blessings and his favor. And it's going to change some of our lives. Can you say amen? Now. Paul said in the first chapter, before I go back to that verse right there, uh, Chris, put Ephesians back up for me, the one right before that. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Paul understood something when he wrote this. He understood that the foundation of any blessings that come your way and mine is based on one fact. All blessings that you're ever going to get is based on one fact. And that is God is a blessed God. Amen. Blessed be the God. And Peter says it even better. He says the blessed God. God is a blessed God. He's not frail. He's not impoverished. He's not impotent. impotent. He's not broke. He is not El Chipo. He's El Shaddai. He's the God of plenty. And let me tell you what. There's nothing in the universe that is beyond his ownership. He owns it all. I know the mining companies feel like that when they dig that ore out of the ground, that gold and the silver and precious metals, they feel like they own it. But my Bible says, the silver and gold are mine, saith the Lord. It belongs to him. Oil companies are now getting oil out of the earth in ways that we never dreamed. There's rock that they're, they're changing into oil. And, and it's just amazing, the creativity. And they may feel like that we have all this in, ingenuity and creativity to do this, and it's ours. But I want to ask you a question. Uh, who owns creativity? Who owns ingenuity? Who owns the ability to have talents and capabilities of learning secrets of the earth? I'll tell you who owns it. God owns it all. Did you know the devil don't own anything? Gangs do not own our neighborhoods. Thieves don't own what they steal. There may be a temporary transfer of authority over things, but it's temporary. And one day I read in Revelation chapter 5 where it says there's a being sitting on a throne with a book in his right hand. And there's a lamb comes up and takes it out of his hand. And he begins to open the seals. And when he opens the seals, you know what that little book is? It is the title deed of earth. And God is saying, I'm taking back everything that belongs to me because the sin field world is not going to have this earth. The meek shall inherit the earth, which is saints of God. It belongs to God. Can I have an amen? My point is this. If you're going to, if you're going to receive a blessing, you have to have some confidence. Does the person saying they're going to give it have the ability to give it? A check is no better than the person that writes the check. Can they pay? And I came to tell you, God can pay. God is able. Turn to somebody and say, God is able. To three different people. God is able. God is able. God is able to do. God is able to do exceedingly. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the working of His mighty power. God is able to bless you. You agree with that? He's able to bless us. Well, I want to tell you something about His blessing. God's blessings come with a warranty. And when I go to Walmart and I buy something, nearly everything you buy has a warranty to it, some kind of label on it. And they ask if you, at the, as you're checking out, do you want to get extended warranty with it? It's got a certain limited warranty that comes with that product. And the reason they give warranties is simply this. When you, as a consumer buying it, it may have a defect. And so they, they warrant the product limited, in a limited span of time. And then you can get extended warranty if you want to pay extra, which is stupid. And then, you know... And, and, and you, can, you can take that umbrella of coverage and stretch it. Or you can get lifetime warranty, which is kind of a joke because all our tables over there that are falling apart, have on the, on the, they got a lifetime warranty. But you know what I challenge you to do? Call up the company that owns those tables and say, I've got 10 tables over here that says lifetime warranty on it, and I'd like to get a hold of you and get this straight. Well, one thing is you may never get them on the phone. They'll put you on hold and you'll listen to elevator music, music until you're sick of elevator music. <laughs> and I, I tell you what, according to the world's warranty, it simply usually is not worth the effort to try to even go through the rigmarole of getting the thing paid back to you. It just doesn't work that way. Well, I want to tell you, God's warranty is different on His blessings. You know how God does His warranty? 
You don't call him up on the phone. He comes and knocks on your door. Deuteronomy 28, 2. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. They'll overtake you. That's like David saying, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the day. Follow me. All is following me. You turn around, no matter where you're going, and there's goodness and mercy following you all the days of your life. You know, I heard, you know the old story of the police officer that uh, the guy runs through town and is taking off and he's going 100 miles an hour. The police officer chases him down and, 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 and pulls him over and he says, what in the world are you doing going so fast? He said, mister, you are my last person that I'm going to have anything to do with tonight. I am tired. I've been on a long stretch and I'm going home as soon as we're through. And I don't really want to run you through all this rigmarole anymore than I want to go through it. So if you'll give me one good excuse for you going so fast, I'll let you go. The man thought a moment. He turned to him and he said, sir, it's like this. Two months ago, my wife ran off with a policeman. And I thought it was him trying to bring her back. <laughs> I tell you, the blessings of God are better than that. They won't bring that thing back to you. <laughs> He brings good things to us. Can I have an amen? Turn to somebody and say, he's bringing her back. <laughs> oh, Lord. No. Riley says, I don't want her back. No, he doesn't say that. Deuteronomy 28.2 says, these blessings are going, all of them are going to come on you and overtake you. But the, I didn't finish the, the verse. If you obey the Lord our God. In anything that God ever promises, it has a contingency clause. I'll heal the sick, but you've got to call for the elders. I'll save anybody, but you've got to ask for in repentance to believe. And you've got to do something yourself. Everything he does has a contingency, an if. Can I have an amen? amen. And so he says if. So I'm asking you, what is it that he wants us to do? Out of all the things that, I mean... Obeying God, but in what way? I'll give you this scripture. Go back to 1 Peter again, Chris. I'll have you jumping back and forth. Look at, look at this latter part. Do not repay evil with evil or insult for insult. On the contrary, repay evil with what? Why? Now, there's a reason why you give blessings. Because they treat, somebody cuts you off in traffic, and instead of giving them a Hawaiian wave, you know what I mean? Or in, instead of you looking at him and saying, you idiot, and, and giving him a verbal lashing, he says, instead of doing that, no matter what has been done to you, don't return evil, return a blessing. Wouldn't it be something the next time you get so aggravated at, 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 in, in Walmart and you're standing in line and everything breaks down up there, they're going to call every little item in and you're standing in the line and you thought it was the shortest line because there's only, you find out why it was the shortest line? Only dumb people got an in. You did. <laughs> Wouldn't it be something instead of you say, saying something to that teller about why do you do all that? Why don't you say, you know, I bless you. Standing over just quietly, I bless this lady. I bless this machine. I bless this. Uh, do you know what would reverse that situation quicker than anything else? Is not you sitting there grumbling and griping and complaining and spewing out of your mouth all this junk. It's blessings that change everything. Contrarywise, repay evil with blessing. Why? Because to this were you called. Now, if I were to point at Paul and I say, Paul, I believe that there's an, uh, an, an anointing of apostleship on you. You're called to be an apostle. Everybody would say, wow, is that right? A, an apostle. Or if I looked at Joe and I said, Joe, I see the gifting of a prophet in you. Uh, I'm a pastor. We, we tend to take the five-fold ministry and say, wow, it's nice to be in the, have that kind of calling on your life. But can I tell you, there's a higher calling than a five-fold ministry. Everybody here's got a spiritual gift. So I want you to turn to somebody and tell them this. You've got a spiritual gift. Would you do that? You've got a spiritual gift. Everybody's got one. may not be the same thing, and it usually isn't. But I'm telling you, there's a higher calling than my being a pastor. There's a higher calling than whatever you're called to do. And that is, you are called to bless. To be a blessing. You're called to bless. The word called is the word kaleo in the Greek. It is the same word that you use when you have a little baby that's just been born. And they come up and ask you, what's the baby going to be called? 
The calling here is when you put a name on a child, you set distinctively their, who they are. You are, you are taking them and putting them underneath that name that all the days of their life they will be identified. It is their identity of that name. I'm Daryl. Always been a Daryl. Didn't want to be a Daryl. Hated the name Daryl. I had another name I was called all my life till I was up in my teens. And I'm not going to tell you what it is because it sounds stupid. So, uh, sorry about that. And I remember hearing my name being called Daryl in school and thinking, I hate that name. Call me by my other nickname. Uh, but I tell you what, it's my identity. It's who I am. Daryl the Squirrel. I know, you know there's all kinds of things they call me. Daryl Big as the Barrel, which wasn't true. But I'm telling you, whatever your name is, it distinctly identifies you as that person with that name. And I'm telling you, God is saying this. There's a calling on you that you're called. You're called to be a blessing and to bless people on this earth. It's higher than apostleship, higher than prophet, higher than anything. You have a calling on your life to bless other people. Do you see that in that text? Why? That you may inherit a blessing. Okay? What does it mean to bless someone? What does it mean to bless someone? Would you sneeze for me? Oh, thank you. Zachary, did you do that? Thank you, Zachary. Quick response. And Zachary, what do you expect me to say to you, Zachary? Yeah, bless you. Okay. Would you do that again, please? Okay. Well, you're real quiet now. <laughs> and I say, bless you. Our God dis babe I said I dis God bless you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, God bless you. Uh, do, do you understand where that came from? In the 6th century, when the bubonic plague, it's hard for me to say, blah, 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 plague came out of the 6th century, killed over 100 million Europeans. Pope Gregory commanded, most of his people were, that people were Catholic. He commanded them, when someone sneezes, which is a telltale sign that you're getting the plague, it was one of the major signs, people continue sneezing. You, I command you to bless them. In the 6th century, when someone started sneezing, you blessed them because of the plague. Nowadays, it's because of Mississippi junk that's in there, right? And we got all the... But we say it all the time. He said, bless you. And we don't have any idea the power of blessing. It's not as simple as bless you. Bless you. It's not that. It's the, the word's Barak. It means to speak the intention of God over a person. When I speak a true blessing, listen to me, when I speak a true blessing, and it comes from my heart and I bless you, it's just words, but when I say it out of my heart and I bless you, and you say it out of your heart and bless somebody, what you're doing is you are speaking prophetically over that person of what God's intentions are and not where they're at at the moment. When Jacob blessed his boys, can I tell you, none of his boys were where he said they were. Judah was not anywhere close to having a scepter where the, the king of kings would come down through his line. These boys were ragamuffins and they were a rough bunch. Can I tell you, but he spoke over them what was not. God calls those things which be not as though they were. He calls him Abraham when he doesn't even have a child, the father of many. He calls her Sarah, the mother of many, when she didn't have a baby. He calls him Peter when he's the most sinking sand there is, but he calls him a rock. It's because Jesus never starts where you are. He starts where you're going. And he says, this is who you are. And the blessing, the blessing itself has a power in it. You say it's just words. But when you say it from your heart and you speak to that child or to that person and you say bless you and you mean it from your heart, you've released a power. Something's come out of your mouth. If God can create worlds out of his mouth and I'm in his creation, then I've got power to, of life and death in my mouth. I can do it. I can kill. I can make alive. I've got power in my mouth. Turn to two people and say, you've got power in your mouth. Speak the good right thing. Amen. The power in your mouth. I've been to the uh, uh, part of the country not too far from where Moses led the children of Israel. When we traveled by bus, 
It, I've never seen desolate desert for miles, just flat sand, nothing for miles. Out in the middle of this, my son and I went on this trip and we stopped at a little a, a store, an oasis, out in the middle of it. It's the only thing there. And they, they, we got a little stuff with our name with sand on it and all that stuff. Souvenirs that we got from there. But I, the heat on sand, I don't know if you've ever encountered it. In Oklahoma, where I grew up, I used to hold, hire myself out. I said this one time to Sister Shoemaker. I said, you know, I used to be a whore. <laughs> and Sister Shoemaker used to sit back here and say, Brother Blankenship! <laughs> I said, I hired out to hold grass. I had people's stuff. I'm like, yeah, okay. Sorry, Sister Shoemaker. That's the way it was. And my grand... That, part of Oklahoma where my granddaddy owned uh, 200 acres of watermelons, just watermelons, not counting the other truck farming we did, was all sandy land. I remember uh, being out there by myself and having my jug of water and that that one row, I'd do two rows on each side, go down by myself and I, I'd get at the end of that thing and they'd be almost a quarter of a mile long and I thought I'm not going to make it back to them. I mean, sand has a way of reflecting heat and it is horrible. My whole point is this. It's no wonder that when the, uh, Moses is standing there listening to the sheep uh, bleeding and listening to cows lowing and listening to the stinking murmuring of a congregation when they don't have any water in that sandy terrain. Uh, I can understand he is feeling because you understand in the in that context when he's about to do what he's about to do, he's just lost his sister, probably his best friend. They won't give him any slack because they're so self-absorbed in their own pain. They don't care that he lost his sister or what he's going through. He's thirsty too. And so he makes the biggest mistake of his life. God speaks to him and says, speak, bless. That rock. He was supposed to speak a blessing to that rock, to bless that rock. We know what he did. He took his rod. Before he smoked that rock twice, he hit it twice. He'd already hit the rock once earlier. Now he's going to hit it twice. And he looks at the people, and here's what he says. He's aggravated. And I've been to Israel several times, and if you want to find the most bickering, arguing, we couldn't even get in our bus one time because they were standing out there on the street just yelling at each other. I've never seen people that love to just argue. And, and he's looking at them and here's what he says. He's so fed up. He is at a boiling point. And he says, you rebels! You bunch of stinking... I believe it would... You know, can I put it in blankenship language? <laughs> you, you, you're the worst congregation a man can have! Do I have to bring water out of the rock for you again? Well, uh, surprise. Moses, you couldn't bring water out of the rock to begin with. But he curses the people and he strikes the rock and he cancels his trip to the Holy Land. He can't go to the Promised Land. And the Bible says he spoke unadvisedly with his lips. It wasn't just what he did, it's what he said. He said to those people, what he should have done is realize, Paul said it like this. He said, the rock that followed them in the wilderness was Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Listen to this. The rock that followed them in the wilderness was Christ. He hit it the first time, and then from then on, he was to speak to it, the blessing, and it would gush water. Christ died once. When you keep striking Christ, you're crucifying Him over and over. And instead of cursing the people and blessing the rock, I mean, instead of blessing the rock and just blessing the people, He reversed it. Here's, the, here's what I'm telling you. From that moment on, Christ is re-crucified. Every time you look at His creation, brothers and sisters, and you speak a demeaning, cutting, sarcastic, mean word to them. You're striking the rock because Christ was stricken once 
And from then on, all that we need to get the flow of God's blessing in water form is we speak blessings. And unless blessings are coming out of your mouth and you're speaking to me, that's why, let me tell you, cussing someone out, cussing at somebody, saying ugly things to people, don't you dare let me hear you say something about my son. You come up and say something about my son that he's a low down good for nothing and you have a negative word to say about him. Well, I'm his daddy and you don't do that to me. I mean, to my son because you're doing it to me and you and me are going to have a little fist fight in, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and do you think that God doesn't care that all of His creation, that when we curse them, when we have ugly words to say to people, when we don't bless them instead, I'm only called to do one thing, and that is to bless. Regardless of how you treat me, regardless of what circumstances I'm in, I have one calling, and that is I am to bless everything. Did you know an average Jew blesses 100 times a day? Amen. When they're eating their food and they're eating a salad, they said, I bless this salad, O oh Lord, for the green, green color and for the wonderful flavor, and they'll name the flavor. They said, average of 100 blessings a day. Can I tell you? What you say has an important power over you. One man said, I had a woman to introduce her children, and said there were three kids. And says, two boys and a girl. And she looked at this. She said, this is my son. He's a bully. And he said, boom. He kicked me in the shins. He said, this is my other son. He's dumb. And the boy went, duh. She said, this is my daughter. And she's shy. And she came behind her mom and hid. He said, I watched that mama as she had named and called them exactly the kind of characteristics that were in their lives. She had put it on them by telling them that you're dumb. You're a bully. And they began to live it out. They asked the men in jail. They polled a lot of prisoners and said, why are you here? 90% of the men of thousands polled made this statement. I'm here because my daddy always said, boy, you're going to end up in jail. And I didn't want to let my daddy down. Jim Sundberg became one of the best baseball catchers uh, for the Houston Astros. And can I tell you what? He used to say this. He said, my daddy, when I was a little bitty tight, would put a glove in my hand and say, Jim Sundberg, you're going to be the best baseball catcher that there ever is. And he said, you know what? I became a good one because I didn't want to let my daddy down. Can I tell you, what you say has an important impact on everything around you. Whether you bless or you curse. Put this up here on James, Chris, if you would. Look what it says. No man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil, but full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. I read where a woman had all kinds of problems with her boss. Never could get along with him. Worked there for years. They never had a civil word between them. She got overlooked for promotion. He did it on purpose. He didn't like her. She knew it. Her recourse as a Christian was around the water fountain. She let him know what she thought of him. At home, where she went, I'm being mistreated. And one day, a woman came up and said, I've been studying about blessing, and I think you're doing it wrong. I think you need a blessing. At first, it didn't set well. But the next morning, it was Wednesday morning. She went early. She went into his office. She laid hands on his chair, and she said, Lord, I, I'm blessing him. I bless him. And she spoke a blessing over the office. She spoke a blessing over him and left. The next morning, she repeated it. Friday morning, telling you a true story. Friday morning, he called her in and said, I just wanted to apologize to you. I've overlooked you, treated you wrong. I understand what I've done to you all these years. And I want you to know I'm very sorry. But I'm telling you this. From the moment you should have got the, the, this raise and this promotion a long time back, I'm going to make it retroactive and every bit of the money that you should have had is coming to you. And she said, I walked out there, my mouth just flying open. How in the world did in two days of blessing, all the cursing I've done for years and months did absolutely nothing but change the whole situation in a matter of two days. You have power in your mouth. You've got power to bless. 
You can bless your neighbor that's littering your yard with all the trash and, and talks ugly to you. You can bless him. The way to get back to them is the Bible says if you'll give him food to eat when he's hungry, give him something to drink, you'll heap coals of fire upon his head. In other words, the blessing will change it. it will, yeah. Nothing else will. Fire didn't put out fire. Water puts out fire. And water comes through blessing. I have one more thing to say, and this is an old illustration, and Phyllis will remember it, Ron, and everybody's been here for a while, but I'll just tell you, it's part of who I am. Because I, this right here is, is obedience. When you obey, when you obey the word to do what we're talking about, you, you walk in obedience, it'll change everything. I was 16 years old. I'd been saved about a year when a guy came to town who had a tent. It's a big tent, 16 miles from my home. It's 8, Oklahoma, and they, he put it up in the arena there. His name is Maury Simon. His brother was our general superintendent of the Pentecostal Holiness Church. He's a great man. Had tremendous miracles and healing. Uh, well, I went to his meeting and he asked me one night, a buddy of mine and, and I went, said, uh, could you boys help me with the, the tent? Could you uh, watch my tent? So the next night we came and we brought our 22 rifles with us and our little cots. And we uh, slept all night with that 22 <laughs> close. There wasn't anything to protect us. And we were going to shoot anything that came along in the name of Jesus. And so uh, we had our little guns right there and all that. Well, uh, I believe it was that night that he stood up there and showed us a piece of paper. Brother Simon showed this and said, this right here is a, a doctor's certified letter. And he said, let me tell you about it. He said, uh, I received a phone call back some time ago. He was out in Virginia or somewhere in that area preaching. He said, I received a phone call uh, from a lady that had been in my services. And she said this. She said, Brother Simon, my sister just got word that she has terminal cancer about a year to live. She's 21 years old and just got married. And she had she hadn't got long. It's terminal. So uh, I told her, if you could get out here, Brother Simon, pray for her. He's had a lot of miracles with this. And he said, yeah, have her come. I'll pray for her. And so the next night of the meeting, somehow she got on the plane right away and flew. And, and, and he saw the woman sitting out there with another woman and figured that's the sister. So he's believing this is the night for her healing. And so he preaches on salvation, come to Jesus, and gives the altar call, and the altar fills up with people, and he's praying for them to get saved. And all of a sudden he says, I feel like right now is the right time for healing. Anybody in this building need a healing? I tell you, God's going to heal you tonight. He said, I began to pray for people around the front. God was doing works, miracles. And all of a sudden, I look back over here. That where Luke is. Raise your hand, Luke. Okay, she was over in about this section right there. And, said, I, and she, did, she didn't budge. He, he said, I looked at her and I was kind of wondering. And he said, I had to close the service now because I knew she flew over there and she was dying. And why didn't she even come? And he said, he said, I, I preached this the next night. I got preached on sanctification. This is old, old time Pentecostal, you know. <laughs> on sanctification, putting jump down and living for Jesus. And Paul gave an altar call, come down to be sanctified. Altars filled up. And he said, it's time for healing. Come tonight. Tonight's your night. And he said, I looked back and she didn't get up. The whole time we prayed for people, not one move. Didn't budge. He said, it's the third night. I preached on Receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. People all over the place getting the baptism. He said, it's a, it's a marvelous night. And he said, I started to call for anybody want to be prayed for. And I said, wait a minute. Before we pray for the sick, let's sing. He touched me. Ah! She jumped up and screamed. This, this is the one that hadn't moved in three days. She runs down the aisle and plows into the altar. And he didn't have, have any idea what's going on. He goes over and prays for her. And he's holding this document up in front of me. I'm watching all this. He said, I invite you to come look at this. She had a clean bill of health when she went home. She's completely healed. And she told me. I was riding there playing Brother Simon. And while I was sitting in my seat, just <coughs> biding my time, a voice spoke and said, I'm going to heal you. <laughs> but don't you go down to the front until they sing, He Touched Me. She said, I've been waiting every night for you to sing, He Touched Me. And He's healed me. The only reason she got the blessing was because she obeyed. The only reason Peter got two boatloads full of fish was because Jesus
just said, launch out into the deep for a catch. And he says, I've been fishing all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, and he obeyed, and God favored him. Listen. If Jesus is in your boat and he says do something, you can just count on it. The favor and blessings of God are coming. I'm going to share this one last thing and I don't have it in my heart. I memorized I was going to read it because here it is. It's in 2 Kings. Listen to this. 2 Kings chapter 7 verses 1 and 2. Four lepers are starving to death because in the city of Samaria, women are boiling their babies. The king comes and walking along in sackcloth and a lady comes up to him and says, oh, I want you to tell this woman to boil her baby. He said, yesterday, she said she'd boil hers if I boiled mine first. I boiled mine, we ate it. And it made the king so sick, he covered himself in sackcloth and ashes. And then he blames God. The reason we're in bad, this bad shape is God. He said, if Elisha lives any longer, so help me God. If I don't kill him. The Bible says, if you read there, that Elisha heard the messenger of death, the assassin, coming. And while he was coming, there was somebody else in the room with him. He says, I perceive this is what's going to happen. He's going to try and kill me. Basically what he said. But I'll tell you what. Today, it, to get donkeys dung, you have to pay an exorbitant amount of money just to get the dung of the donkey. That's how hungry they are. But by tomorrow, he named... You're going to get loaves of bread for a penny. You're going to get food just coming up. And, and the man, the Bible says, on whom, listen, the king leaned on his arm. The king, Elisha says, by tomorrow, this time God's about to pour a flood of favor and blessing. And the Bible says, the man on whom the king leaned on said, if God opens all the heaven up, poof. That's not going to happen. Do you know what? The king was in trouble because of who he leaned on. You know what? You've got to watch who you're leaning on. We had somebody sing years ago. Lean on me. He didn't sing it like that. He, lean on me. He wants the whole world to lean on him. He's 11 years old. He ain't got all his hair yet. His voice is too high. He, he's, he's immature. He wants the world to lean on him. You got to watch who you hang with and who speaks into your life. And the king was leaning on this guy. And Elisha looks at him and says this. He says, God's going to pour out favor, a flood of favor and blessings. You'll never see a bit of it. And the Bible says that man stood in the gate. I have a little piece of advice for you. When God starts pouring out his favor around here, don't you dare try to block it. He's trying to block what's about to happen. And he stood in the gate for a purpose. And the Bible says they trampled him to death. They went out outside the camp and got all that food, brought it back in. He didn't see a bit of it. Now, I tell you what, it's something. I've seen this happen too many times. To be around all the blessings of God and you're not getting a drop. Dry as a shut. <laughs> don't know what's going on. There, don't move, to, don't move me. Sure, I'm going to tell you why you're in a dangerous place. You better get out of the way if God starts pouring out His blessing. Because there's only one thing that will stop the blessings of God. You say, I, I'm not worthy of this. John the Baptist said he was the best prophet. Jesus said he's the best prophet. The, 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 the best that's ever lived. Yeah, the best that's ever lived. And yet he said, the one that's coming after me, his sandal straps, I'm not worthy to reach down and unloose. If you feel like I'm unworthy of the blessings of God, welcome to John the Baptist's group. Welcome to my group. And I fight this all the time. Somebody can walk up to me. Listen to me. And I'm about to close. David, you can, look, you can walk up to me and start paying me a compliment. I get, so, I get nervous as a cat. I'm telling it like it is. My wife, I, I can't. You can, you can talk ugly to me and I can handle it better than you talking good to me. It's because we get this mental problem of blocking blessings. I, I can't have someone speak over me while they're believing God for my life. And we block it. The only thing that God's block, blocks God's blessing is not your imperfections and, and your flaws and the things you feel like I'm weak in. There's only one thing that will block it. That's unbelief. God's going to pour out His favor. Bah, humbug. Sure He is. Hey, I'm just telling you, you better watch out. You better get out of the gate. Because when this thing gets unshackled and loosed, somebody's going to get run over. Would you stand with me? If I feel like that anything about my message 
is a word from the Lord. I feel like that is. If God says, I'm about, and I feel like that He said it, you have to guess that. This is just me and God. God speaking at the barn. I'm about to flood, pour out a flood of my blessings and favor. And if it's anything like the natural flood we're having right now, Lord, I don't have any way to comprehend how we're going to hold this. Lord Jesus.